thought it was the evil. Oh, yeah. oh, maybe with your tongue you could get it. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I promised to be nice today. <laughs> Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Joanne got, led me down the sin, road of sin and degradation. She got me started on this history deal. And like she said, once you start down the, the rabbit hole, you can't ever get out. Because the more you see, the more you wonder what in the world was that about. Anyway, so she asked me to do a history on uh, the Kitchen Cattle Company. Has anybody heard of the Kitchen Cattle Company? Has anybody heard of, uh, of uh, J.K. Mills Lightning Creek Branch? Has anybody heard of Taylorville? Well, they're all the same deal. All the same, just different steps. Anyway, Emma Taylor was the one that homesteaded on Lightning Creek. I've got a map here of the county. It doesn't show the creek, but what I'm talking about is right in here, out in the middle of nothing. That's basically all this country out here is nothing. But anyway, that's where it is. Okay, I'll pass that around. And then I've got the land plats here that show the creeks on it. Okay, here's 20 Mile Creek, Lightning Creek. And then this one's the next one over. It shows Lance Creek. And this is the area we're talking about here. And so these aren't up to date. It shows Bill Nance Park, but it's the kitchen. And so you can look at these and have a general idea of the country we're talking about. Uh, Emma Taylor was the first one to homestead in there. And uh, I mean, Mary Taylor. And, Jim Meg's related to him, so he knows that portion of it. Great, great grandpa. But he, on Landing Creek, he homesteaded the best spring there. I've never seen it go dry. And most of Landing Creek goes dry. It's a really, really good spring. And that's where he built his headquarters and everything. And he had a really nice ranch in there. And then he sold out and moved to Lusk. He sold out to Jakey. Mills. JT headquartered up here on Sage Creek, but he expanded. He had a, he was a, a goer. And uh, according to the Nightmare history book, it said he had uh, 40,000 sheep and 2,000 cattle. Now I find that to be a little exaggerated. He had a lot of bands of sheep, I've been told, 14 bands of sheep. And uh, I don't know how many they had bad of used lamps. I'm told, you know, 1,200 or so. So that wouldn't make 40,000. But well, one of the interesting things was he figured out that all that land up there that hadn't been homesteaded, all that federal land, if you controlled the water, you controlled the land. So what he did, he had, had a string of 40s up Twenty Mile Creek, down the Lightning Creek, up Lance Creek. And that's how he controlled all that country. And, uh, and another way he controlled it, he had a band of weathers, castrated male sheep. And uh, they had strictly one purpose. They took the wool off of them, but their real purpose was to keep the bands of sheep coming down from Gillette <coughs> out of all that country. So when they get word that there was some band of used lambs coming down, Dad said those weathers could travel like half saddle horses. And that's herder's job was to take them to the ewes and lambs. And doggone, they'd run them around the ridge and slam them into all that herd of ewes and lambs. So then they'd either have to pin them or some way they had to separate the sheep. Well, every time they did that, they bummed them on lambs. And he said if they didn't catch on the first time, they, a couple days, they'd ram them into them again. And he said, this guy's got the idea to keep their sheep out of that country they went back north so he was pretty clever on that deal and they had to, had then they had all their bands of using lambs and uh, and they actually people didn't I mean uh, Carla Reed and Wanda Hansen didn't realize it but they actually homesteaded up there uh, Philomena and Jakey they they had uh, I've got the the plats, you know, the patent plats and everything. 
and they they homestead a part of that where it was open, quarter mile wide down the creek. 40s, 440s here, 440s there, and then they bought out homesteaders that had, were on the creek, so they could control all that country. But I always wondered how they got that land on Lance Creek. Well, it was usual deal for a successful rancher. Uh, Tomina's father owned the U-Bar-L on Lance Creek, one of the old-time big outfits, and he married her. And so they bought that land from her dad. And it's interesting, I'm, I'm looking at the abstracts, and when uh, Jakey, they sold all that country out, they reserved all the mineral rights down last year that came with the U-Bar-L. It didn't go to the kitchen. So uh, he was a sharp fella, no doubt about it, but he got overextended. And so they had to sell out, and that's how the, the kitchen corporation came in the picture. You know, he sold out there and pulled back the hat trick and, and uh, retired and died there. But uh, I don't know how these, the kitchen corporation, I believe there was 11 original people from Omaha. Dick Kitchen was the president of it. You can hear all stories about how I got named, but Dick Kitchen was the president of it. They, uh, they were incorporated in Omaha, Nebraska. But Shirley Crowfoot told me that the reason they bought it was because of the mineral rights. Lance Crick Fields had hit, and they bought it in 1920, and uh, they bought it for the mineral rights. I wonder if they even saw that land. Anyway, they, in 1930, for whatever reason, like I say, I spent all day yesterday reading abstract, they, they um, they incorporated in Wyoming in 1930, even though they bought it in 1920. <coughs> but they uh, they capitalized it with uh, $250,000. They sold stock, $100 a share. Originally, they subscribed 220,000 of it, and they had 11 shareholders. And the interesting part for me was Felix Nern, Faye Baker's dad, was around there. And he was like the manager of it, but he was not one of the original shareholders. So I do not know how he got that, whether he bought in it. He was quite a wheeler and dealer. And uh, what's really interesting is when they, uh, they made a trust for the mineral rights, this was in 1962, and they have 18 people in the trust for the mineral rights. And it's obvious by the names, similar last names, that, that some of them inherited, it was kids. And, and so you had stuff like 1.5556% of the minerals. <laughs> but Felix Nern has 30%. I have no idea how he got it. And Dick Kitchen's widow, she only has 20%. Those were the two major stockholders on the uh, Kitchen Mineral Trust. And that's still in existence today. They have over, they have uh, uh, just over 6,000 net acres of minerals. And uh, Shirley Crowfoot's daughter married uh, a guy who's a lawyer and a petroleum engineer, and he's the trustee for the minerals. He lives in California. And so uh, it works out really good. We got to know him well. and So we throw our mineral rights in with his, and, and we have about 10,000 net acres of minerals, so that gives us some leverage. We've got a really, really good uh, mineral lease last go-round, and he said he thought we were going to get one more, but I'm starting to doubt it. <laughs> but, but anyway, the reason I say I cannot believe that they actually looked at this land, because being good businessmen from Omaha, and obviously not farmers, they plowed a bunch of that country up and planted corn. <laughs> now you got all that corn, what are you going to do? They hauled in hogs. They're going to fatten hogs out there. <laughs> well, I've got pictures here <laughs> that just tickle the heck out of me. Now, I think the date on this is wrong because they did, it says Taylorville, 1918. They did not buy it until 1920. So I think that date's wrong, but but uh, 
I got the original pictures and I had them all redone so they could print and everything. And uh, there's those hogs out there bigger than Dallas. <laughs> but the interesting story is they they haul those hogs in old trucks and they're going down into 20 mile into the creek and it's pretty dang steep. The brakes went out and they rolled the truck and they turned all those hogs loose. And I guess there's a lot of good cowboys got bucks off when those pigs would jump out from under the sagebrush and squeal. Well, anyway, they got these hogs, what they could, gathered, and they got them down there. And they had hog pens and all this good stuff. And, and they had the corn to feed them and all, but yeah, right. they were kind of free range hogs. And Charlie Wright was one of the first ones to homestead in that country. He was between our place and the kitchen. But those hogs would go down through those meadows and they'd get down on his meadows and they'd run his meadows up. And he didn't care for that. But being the good neighbor he was, he provided all the homesteaders with fresh pork. <laughs> 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 so, anyway, that was an abject failure, I think, their whole deal. But, like any big corporation with absentee landowners, they hired a rodeo cowboy to be the manager. Now, that was bad compounding with worse. <laughs> His name was Powder River Thompson. And he was quite a bronc rider. He went to England with the Wild West show, rode Bronx in front of the Queen. Shirley Crowfoot had a big panoramic picture of all the riders, and he's in it. He won the amateur bronc riding at Cheyenne. Uh, anyway, some way he be asked him into believing that he'd be a really good ranch manager. <laughs> <laughs> but his main concern was whiskey. He really liked whiskey. <laughs> and one of my favorite stories is they ran all those sheep out there, and so they sheared and they sent him to town to get the coin. They paid off the sheep shears in coin. So he got the coins, got, I think they got there on Friday, you know, got several sacks full of coins, you know. And then he stopped by the bar to have a drink, and, and he was still there Sunday morning. And he thinks maybe he ought to head home, but wait, he hears him singing in choir in church, and he thinks maybe I should go to church. So he goes to church, and he joined the choir. They did not appreciate that, so he figured out he wasn't wanted, so he went down there and he reached into his bag and he grabbed handfuls of coins and rolled them down the aisle to watch the kids scramble for them. I think that was the last time they saved him time to get money for the sheep shears. But he really liked his whiskey, and there's a, I've got a picture, I've got this book, I'll pass it around. Now this has got historical pictures of the kitchen. Shirley Crowfoot was Powder River Thompson's daughter, Powder River Thompson and Faye Baker. Faye Baker was married to a guy down at, uh, Felix Norton was her dad, had a ranch down around Gordon. He was killed in a team. Uh, team ran away with him, he was on a rake, and it killed him. That little daughter, Billy, that was nine days old, so Faye Baker came up to the kitchen because Nern had an interest in it and she stayed at the kitchen. Well, old Potter, he showed up there. Of course, he's got a lot of flash and dash. They got married and Shirley Crowfoot, Shirley Thompson Crowfoot was their daughter. Well, this didn't work really good. This wasn't exactly a marriage made in heaven. So, so they got it. Faye Baker and and Powder got divorced and they sent him on down the road. And uh, Billy, when she was nine years old, got diphtheria. And so they had a, had a house north of Douglas that they put all those people in. It was a isolation house for them. And, uh, and she died in that house. Shirley remembers Shirley was a little girl and to her picture are in here. She remembers him taking Billy away and she never saw her again. So Faye Baker had a pretty traumatic life, tough life. And then after they ran old powder off, then Harry Baker came through the country. He was he'd been riding the rails. This is in the Depression, the thirties. He'd been riding the rails and the kitchen was always had people coming and going and they hired him on there. And Faye and Harry Baker end up getting married. And they had two kids, Dick and, and uh, 
at Jeannie, and they lived up there. And then they end up when the kitchen sold out, they bought the adjoining ranch. And uh, what we call the Baker Place. It was originally the dual place. There was two sisters that homesteaded there. And a little known fact is, some people estimate as many as 20% of the homesteaders were single women. We'd ride around and dad would say, he called them all old lady. Old lady Sassine, that was her homestead. And old lady, they were probably 30, I don't know how old they were, but dad was born in 1918. He was kind of a kid then, but they were all old to him. And, and most of them married a homesteader on the adjoining land. But uh, uh, these two sisters, Warren Duell, he lived, he had homestead over on Cow Creek to the north. He married one of them. Uh, and they lived in, they built this stone, well, the stone house was built, there was this Thompson, was a stonemason, and he built several stone houses. And I mean, they are as solid as you could ever imagine. He was really good. Anyway, Faye and Harry bought that place and then they sold it out in 1957 and Dad and Mom bought it. And that's when they moved to the Crowfoot Place uh, north of Lusk here. And that's where they lived and died there. But uh, anyway, Harry and Faye got married. And then they sold the uh, kitchen, started selling this land off. And uh, Shirley had married Glenn Crowfoot, had just married Glenn Crowfoot. And so they leased this land <laughs> from the Kitchen Corporation, and old uh, 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 Felix Nurm, he was, he was kind of in charge of this deal. So anyway, it's got the, the terms of the lease and everything to, to Felix Nurm. He leased it for three years for a total of $4,250. Well, he turned around and leased it to his granddaughter, Shirley, and her brand new husband for two and a half times that. And with the stipulation that they had to run like 50 head of his cows. He was a nice guy. <laughs> You'll see his picture in there. You can see he didn't have work rough in hands. I'm gonna pass this around, you'll see. What they did is when they, Glenn and Shirley came back and I took them around and we showed them all this stuff. And then their daughter, Sherry, combined the historical pictures with the ones she took. And that's what this book is. And so it's pretty priceless to me. Uh, Sherry had it made into several books and she gave me a copy of it. And you can see the historical pictures. But while I'm talking about uh, another story besides the one about singing with the choir. Old Powder, there was a guy up the creek and nobody knew his story. He was like a kite. He had a little dugout and the picture's in there of his little dugout. His name was Shorty Morehouse. And you never sneaked up on Shorty. Shorty was always a watching. Nobody knew his story, nobody really cared. And he'd help around there a little and I don't know how he made a minute, meeting, uh, how he made a living. I don't think it took very much. He's a little scrawny guy. <laughs> but he liked his whiskey also. So Powder rides up there and so Shorty goes out he's, where he's got his bottle hidden out there. And he brings it down and old, he and old Powder, they tap in it pretty heavy and everything. And when Powder leaves, goes back, right back down the creek to the kitchen. He circles around the hill to watch to see where Shorty hides his bottle. So one day Shorty's gone, and so Potter rides up there and finishes off the bottle. That made Shorty really grumpy. So he gets his hatchet, goes down the creek to the kitchen, and he's going to scalp old Potter. And he did a really good job of it, I guess. Took most of his scalp off. They all he went into Doc Reckling and Doc sewed his skull back together. And, and Shirley, I have found documentation, but Shirley said Shorty spent a couple years in the pen for this. But anyway, when he died up there, uh, Harry Baker was appointed the executor, and he got researching all this. He found out that Shorty had been married, had two boys. He came like from the Pine Ridge Reservation, and he was running whiskey to the Indians. 
which mm -hmm. was really illegal. Yeah. And when they got on his trail, he decided to light out, and he ended up Lightning Creek because he figured nobody would ever find him there, and they were right. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, they sold that. Harry had it all sold out and everything, and the kids got the money, but but uh, that's another powder and shorty story. <laughs> but Powder River Thompson, he's in the Cowboy Hall of Fame now. We got him in the Cowboy Hall of Fame. He's quite a bronc rider and cowboy and everything, even if he wasn't too good a husband. <laughs> but uh, he ended up, for his health, he went down to Arizona and led mule pack trains into the Grand Canyon. And he died down there. And Sherry's daughters went down there, and darn if they didn't find his grave. When they'd given up, they found his grave. But uh, anyway, everybody that knows Shirley Crowfoot, now you know why she's like she is. <laughs> you look at those pictures of her, and you can see when she's a little girl, she still had an attitude. You see that? <laughs> and those hat cut their head. She's holding up a rattlesnake. <laughs> she's the brightest little girl in the country. You can tell she's got that. She got it from old powder. <laughs> but that was really an enjoyable day. And some of those early pictures there in the book are of uh, the dual place where uh, Harry and Faye live. And so we went there, and it's abandoned now, but they took pictures of it. And Glenn Crawford says, okay, this is Shirley was sitting at this table. That's the first time I ever saw her, you know. And he he remembered everything. So and so got bucked off here, and, and he remembered all that country out there. And it was really enjoyable. But uh, now they're gone. About everybody's gone. Faye and and uh, Harry are gone. But but they uh, they sold this out and. Uh, the last people that lived there were the Rizdals. You may have heard of the Rizdals, Jarvis and Doris Rizdal. They came from South Dakota, and there I got a copy of their lease. They could run a, a, a thousand head of ewes out there and uh, fifty head of cows. Well, they came from around Faith. It's pretty flat and everything out there, and I've seen the historical pictures, and there they are just married, they're living in a sheep wagon. They were used to tough, but they got out there and they turned those sheep loose, and it's all those roughs and everything, and no fences, no nothing, no way to control them. Sheep went everywhere, and, and Dad had never met them, but he goes up the creek, and they just moved in, and he sees those sheep on his place. Dad was like Granddad. He really, really, really hated sheep. <laughs> So he goes down there, beats on the door, and Doris comes to the door, and he says, get your damn sheep off my land. <laughs> That's how he agreed to her. What, what, what? Yeah, your sheep are on my land. Get them off. She, Doris will be here. Doris will be here later. <laughs> well, I don't think Doris ever forgave Dad. <laughs> but Dad and Jarvis, they really got along great. So they put in a five-wire fence there to keep the sheep out. But it didn't work worth a darn in those roughs because they couldn't control them. The coyotes ate them. So Jarvis, he had, they had four daughters. They all went to school in Calgary when we went to school. And, uh, and it's a little tough to get out of there. You know, you can spit on the road and not make it out. And he was trying to bring them down the creek about 10 miles to, to school. I remember one time we were in school and they weren't there. And I don't know, about 9 o'clock or something, we looked. Here comes Jarvis with a team and buggy bringing those girls. It was just raining like crazy. Here he is bringing those girls to school. Well, they did figure it out pretty fast. That wasn't going to work very good. So they sold their option to purchase to Leo Thompson and worked for Leo for a few years. But even though you don't know uh, uh, Doris and, and uh, uh, Jarvis Rizdal, you might know their daughter, Carmel Hansen. Remember Carmel and <laughs> Carmel and Dale lived here? <laughs> well, that's their daughter. I got pictures of her when she's in first grade. <laughs> so it was like a big circle, but they were the last ones to live there at the Taylorville kitchen, whatever you want to call it. They worked for uh, Leo Thompson for a few years, then they moved up to Bighorn. No, yeah, wherever, south of Sheridan. And, uh, and so Leo Thompson had it, and he tried to run sheep over there, but 
even though he had an airplane and Jim Thompson had an airplane and they shot a lot of coyotes, they couldn't shoot nearly enough in their rough country. So they quit putting sheep up there and they ran yearlings up there. And then when uh, Leo died, Gary and Marley Scott inherited it. And uh, then they got in a financial bind and they sold it to Bob Stoddard and then Bob Stoddard's been wont to do, he put the screws to them and they sold it for $100 an acre and he used it for five, six years and finally gave him $30 an acre. And then Bob Stoddard got tired of Mark, pa Mark Pollock bought the Emory place and ran Bob Stoddard off, which everybody thought was pretty funny. <laughs> and uh, Mark Pollock raised all that country for free because Bob was afraid to go in there. So then Bob sold it. Bob sold it to a speculator from Texas and was going to flip it. That didn't work, so he had to turn it back. And then this Colvin Massey from Georgia bought it. And he was strictly a spe speculator. And he had a few years and put a buffalo fence, six foot high, six wires, six inch by eight, post all the way against Pollock, try to keep his cattle out, it didn't work. So anyway, uh, he sold it to an investor from Colorado, Bill Sparks. And so Bill Hall hired Joe, my son, and when Joe was there, and the rest of the time I managed the deal, we ran cows there, and Bill wasn't that impressed with it either. So, so he sold it to Joe, but we were the only ones that didn't try to screw Bill Sparks. I mean, when you get fresh money like that, and, and people that don't know a clue, they, everybody wants to get that fresh money. And we were the only ones that didn't cheat him. As a matter of fact, I called him up and I said, well, they bought a bunch of cattle over Savory, and they delivered them. I said, just stick here, truck drivers. I went in and I called him and said, these do not meet specifications. They were barren cows, they were everything, crippled cows. And they would just steal these money, and he gave top dollar for them. He said, that's all right, that's all right, just let it go. You know, he needed bulls, so this guy hooked him up with another shyster, and they bought twice as many bulls, leftover bulls after a bull sale in South Dakota. Dogs, bought all the dogs, paid top dollar, and they delivered them out there. I mean, it's just criminal what they did to this guy. When he decided he had enough, he says, I'm gonna sell it to Joe Cruzy. And he sold it for exactly what he paid for it, which was about, this after he put a lot of money in it. Fences, it was all one big pasture, 3,900 acres. All in big pasture, and put in water and pipe, you know, pipelines and fences. Joe directed all that. So he sold it for exactly what he paid for it, which is at that time was about three quarter market value. So it pays to play honest with people. <laughs> so now this has made a big circle. And Jakey Mills was Katie, Katie, Joe's wife, great great grandfather <laughs> so it's back in the family again and what's really interesting when they homesteaded Jakey Mills homestead right south just right next to Granddad's homestead right off of our fence line 440s there Jakey Mills homesteaded that and then right up the creek his his wife Philomena she's homesteaded 40 acres up there right along the creek and so it's made full circle. It's back in the family again. <laughs> but uh, I don't, you know, I don't know. I can't remember what I said here and what I said in the last bunch, but uh, J.T. Mills was really, really sharp. And what he was doing was he, he was controlling all that BLM out there by controlling the water. So he had all, you know, quarter mile wide down, bottom end of 20 mile, down Lightning Creek, down 20 miles. I mean, Lance Creek, all that country. So they control all that country by controlling the water. And uh, and so that's what they had, all, you know, just a series of 40s down all the creeks. And he had, you know, I've got the patents here, and his brother Oscar homestead on 20 mile, and his sister homestead on 20 mile. And uh, 
and besides their own, you know, the places they bought and their own homesteads and everything. And, and so he had a really, really good operation, but he got in financial trouble, and that's how the kitchen ended up with it. They had to sell out, and then he, bought, he pulled back to his headquarters back on Sage Creek, you know, where Jake Reed lives. And uh, anyway, the kitchen, like I say, Shirley Crowfoot told me they bought the place strictly for the mineral rights. They were businessmen, they weren't ranchers. They bought it for the mineral rights and the Landscape Field had hit. And they thought they were gonna get rich, you know, with the Landscape Field expanding. And so that's what they bought it for and after it didn't expand and I think that they probably didn't make any money on the deal. Matter of fact, they lost money. With Powder as, a, as the, your foreman, Grandma said they would, you know, they had all that land over on Mass Creek. So they come down the creek, those cowboys, they just stop at our place. And they'd sit around in the shade and visit with Grandma all day. She had served lunch and everything. And come mm -hmm. evening, they get on their horse, make a big swing out south, just whipping him right along. So when he rode into the kitchen, he was all sweat up. Well, they'd done a heck of a circle there. They had really, really done the job. Checked all the cattle out. What in actuality, they rode whatever three miles of a gallop. <laughs> and so, one of the grand things they did, they shipped in all these Hereford bulls, three or four year old Hereford bulls from Iowa, grain fed, carload full of them, and they took them out the kitchen. And so, the cowboys, in the middle of summer, you know, put them out the cows. They took them up the divide looking down on Lance Creek and they dropped them. Well, they didn't go there for a while to check on them. Those bulls didn't know anything more than a krill or whatever. Corn fed, they were about all dead. When, I mean, they were close to being dead when they went up there and saw them. They weren't smart enough to go to water. They didn't know what grass was for except laying in it. I guess that was one of the monumental wrecks they had. <laughs> but, yeah, the bulls, you know, big old corn-fed bulls, they didn't even, you know, they didn't have a clue to go to the creek to water. So, so that's what, that was a, what the kitchen was about, raising corn to feed the hogs. And uh, anyway, so they started selling it out and they sold it all out, but, but they made money, the heirs have, by the mineral rights. And so uh, that's a story of, Taylorville, Jakey Mills, Lightning Creek. And Jakey had cow camps, you know, he was spread all over. And he had cow camps, you know, he'd have a, a log cabin and corrals there for his cowboys, you know, to keep track of everything. And one of the cow camps was at the West End. And that's the same one you read about where uh, after the Lightning Creek battle, they took Sheriff Billy Miller, he was wounded, and they put him in that in uh, Jakey Mills cow camp. The, it was right there by the battlefield. And they laid him in there, and, and uh, uh, the deputy that was killed, uh, uh, Falkenberg, that was killed, and then they, there's an Indian chief that was wounded, and they put him in there after everybody, after the Indians had all pulled out. And uh, they, he died there. But uh, that, that was Jakey Mills' cow camp. He had those scared around and the cowboys staying at him. And uh, Jim Ming's great great grandfather was this Emma Taylor, Taylorville. And when the firing started, he told his wife, there's, there's a big escarpment, a great big cut bank around the buildings and everything. It goes up there quite a ways. He had her go up there and hide because they had no idea what was going on because they could hear the, the gunshots down the creek from the battle. And then the, the Indians at night, they buried one of the guys, one of the, that died up there, they buried him at night and they pulled out and they headed, they cut across 20 mile creek and, and they dumped a lot of their stuff up there. And, and they finally caught them south of Edgemont. They got another posse, you know, they sent riders to, to Alaska and they caught them. But it was, uh, you read about the deal, it was a bad deal for both sides. But uh, that was Jakey Mills' cow camp. There's a stone marker up there where the Indian Creek battle was. 
it's right beside where the cow camp was, but it's all kind of rotted down. But uh, that was in 1903, the same year as Kitty Hawk. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer them because I, once you start doing that research, <laughs> you never find an end to it. I, Dad always got these abstracts when he bought land. And I spent a couple of days now reading abstracts on this, and, and uh, it's pretty interesting, you know, where they mortgaged, uh, where they, all that stuff. But, but that's a derivation of the kitchen. But it, it was really Emma Taylor that really got that deal going, and then J.K. Mills expanded it greatly. Yeah, I, I was late. But <coughs> where's Taylorville? Well, Taylorville is also known as J.K. Mills Lightning Creek Ranch, also known as the Kitchen. And I, do you have that <coughs> map, that plat there? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that plat I wrote up. It says Bill and Ann Sparks on it. Uh, that's actually I wrote on it, also known as the Kitchen. And the other one, the other plot I have is, is on Lance Creek. Okay. And see, they ran lower end of 20 mile, and then Lightning Creek <coughs> and Lance Creek. Okay. And it's all the same place, started by uh, Merrick Taylor. Who's, like say, Jim Mayne's great, great grandfather. And it's all kind of, I've got some, uh, oh, I, I got some. Was there a post office or something? Called that's, that's my question. Jim may thought it was an actual post office. I really don't know. They call that place Taylorville. But they, they brought the mail up the creek from Bright Post Office, which is down there by Jimmy Wasserberg. They took, somebody carried the mail up to Taylorville. And I don't know if it's an actual post office or if they just distributed it there. And Jim thought it was an actual post office. I've never seen anything to say one way or another. I don't know. But, uh, and I don't know, maybe they sold supplies out there. There weren't too many. Back in those days, there, you know, like turn of the century, there weren't many people out there. And so, I don't know, maybe they did stocks of supplies and everything. But, but I got those pictures of, uh, uh, he built up quite a place, like say it was, it was a square, it's all log buildings in a square, and they, they had a blacksmith shop and a hog barn, a chicken house and a cook house, and, and they had uh, cowboys, uh, bunk houses for the cowboys. Dad said one time, the big bugs got so bad, cowboys <laughs> saw the palm just towards the bunkhouse. <laughs> let, them, let them build a nail. <laughs> but one of the things they did was uh, the kitchen had this guy named Earl Hall, who they, everybody said, well, he was gassed in World War I. But anyway, it wasn't supposedly, it wasn't quite right in the mind. And they used him <coughs> to try to run off the homesteaders. Now maybe he had PT, SD, whatever. I don't know. So Greg Granddad was one of them that they were gonna run off. Granddad run, didn't run too good. So what they did is they, Earl Hall made this brag that he was gonna rope Granddad and drag him to death. So as bait, they gathered some of Granddad's cows and threw them on the meadow right by the buildings there. So they knew where to get to Granddad. So he got his vast horse, and he got an old jacket, and he got his father-in-law's Colt 45. His father-in-law was a bodyguard for the man that founded Amarillo, Texas. And he was a renowned lawman in Texas. And he fought the Confederate side in World War, I mean in the Civil War. Anyway, Jenny Cruzy, my grandma, inherited his Colt 45. And, and they'd kill antelope with it. It was a shoot son of a gun. It's got three notches on it, too. Anyway, uh, he put that pistol in his pocket and went to get his cows. And he figured when Earl threw that rope, he was going to be a dead man. So they saw him coming, and they had their horses on. They always kept their horses saddled in the barn. 
And so old Earl ran got his horse and came out there swinging his rope. I'm gonna rope, you know, I'm gonna drag you to death. And ran there, just pulled up, waited with his pistol cocked in his pocket. And he figured as soon as he threw that rope, Earl Hall was a dead man. Earl Hall didn't throw the rope. He yacked a little bit, went back, put his horse up, and Granddad didn't have any more trouble with him after that. <laughs> but but some people did. Now, Dad had told me this story quite a few times, and in July of 06, I read this in the Casper Stark Tri Tribune 75 years ago. And doggone, what do they have here? L.O. Penfield, that was Oz Penfield, and Earl Hall were ranchers in the Lusk area. Penfield and Hall also were bitter enemies, and their animosity added another chapter when a jury recommended the two turn over their firearms to Sheriff Will Hassett in the second week of July, 1931. Oz Penfield, I don't know if you've been up North Lance Creek Road, but Leo Thompson had a big set of trails. It's still there. And just on the south side of it, there's a dugout, and that's where Oz Penfield lived, and he farmed that up on top. Well, the kitchen owned the land, the creek there, and Oz had just off there. Well, Oz had just turned his team out on the kitchen because they had feed and water and everything there. Earl Hall worked for the kitchen, you know, and he rode his cattle out of Maastricht, and then he lived where Buster Penfield was. I don't know if he was married to the lady or just living with her. Anyway, so he was going to his place. He got a bright idea. He's going to run off Oz's team. Said, uh, the most recent twist of the feud involved Penfield taking pot shots toward Hall as Hall was in the process of running some of Penfield's horses off a pasture belonging to the Kitchen Land and Cattle Company. Penfield claimed he was only shooting the vicinity of Hall to make a point. <laughs> he must have been really close because I think, I think old uh, Earl got bucked off and, and the joke they were always telling us when he was running up the creek trying to get away from those rifle shots, he's covered 20 feet in the bound. <laughs> Dad was pretty sure that he was trying to kill him, but anyway, uh, bad blood between Penfield and Hall had lengthy trail of legal, legal paper too. Penfield was previously acquitted of an assault on Hall's 13-year-old stepdaughter and Hall was acquitted of shooting Penfield in an earlier case. <laughs> anyway, they just let it drop. But <laughs> I thought that was pretty interesting. And, and like I say, it was in the Casper Star Tribune 75 years ago, and it was just like that that told me about it. <laughs> and that's the same Earl Hall that was going to run Granddad off, was going to rope him and drag him to death. And, uh, and they used him to try to run the homesteaders off. You know, there was a lot of that. I, there was a homesteader that uh, they were trying to run off out of Lance Creek. And this guy died not very long. I mean, well, relatively speaking. But he caught, caught him in the cellar. He closed it up and locked the cellar on him, the homesteaders. And it was several days before anybody came along. But there was a lot of stuff like that went on. And uh, like I say, they didn't run some of those guys off. That's why we're still here. But everybody that homesteaded on the creek, they stayed. If uh, I had that one land plant, you see a lot of BLM up there. We could, you can ride out there and dad say, this is a homestead, you know, and this is a homestead. You can see the old, uh, ruins, maybe there's a board or two or whatever, but they figured out that it wasn't worth five years of their life for that land, and so they just left, and so that's why you see all that BLM out in that country, and uh, like the only water and fuel was on Lightning Creek, and they had to go, you know, maybe two or three miles down there. You probably didn't have 70 degrees in the winter and nice warm <laughs> bath. So about all those people left, all the people who got there early, like my granddad, uh, they all are, you know, well, I guess we're about the only ones left out there. You know, the original homesteaders were the only ones left. But they, uh, only reason we're left is because when Grandma and Granddad got married, my grandmother came from Texas, her brothers went to Billings and Sheridan, 
and they were gamblers and grandmother was a milliner she made fancy hats and stuff and so she came up when they did and uh, my one one uh, her one brother Delbert Flores, A. Delbert Flores, who dad was named after, he was really a good gambler. He built a gambling hall in, in uh, Sheridan with his winnings. And the night before the grand opening, it burned to the ground in suspicious circumstances. <laughs> but Reedney was such a good gambler, he always liked big rings. He always had big diamond rings with big bands. And he could read the cards he was dealing. <laughs> he knew what everybody's hand was. And so he really wanted to ranch, but he had to gamble and make money. And then he'd lose the ranch and he'd go back to gambling. Well, on the Cheyenne River where Slagos lived, that was his ranch. He bought that ranch when he left Sheridan with his earnings. And so Grandma went down there and that's where she homesteaded. She lived down there. And they'd have big dances and everything. And Granddad ride up there, I don't know what it is, 40, 50 miles for dances. And that's how they got together. Well, after they got married, moved down to where we live now, they traded titles on homesteads. And so Grandma got where we are, and Granddad heard her homestead, right? Grandma always had her cows. So in the 30s, when they closed, banks closed Granddad out, they foreclosed on the homestead on the Cheyenne River. They foreclosed on his cows. But they still had their home, they still had all her cows to keep going. And uh, so then they, uh, the neighbor, Charlie Wright, he lived up the creek from us, a little man that was a bachelor. He killed one of the last, I've got a picture of him, killed the last wolf in that country. And he had a, a wolf pup that he kept there, he captured. And he had a wolf house and he had that thing chained on there. and. Uh, and I guess he was fearsome, but that wolf had heard that one, that chained wolf go through there, and they went after him and they got him, and I've got a picture of him with that wolf. But anyway, he got, he was a bachelor, he got ready to sell out. He put bucks, well, adjoining homesteads, he had a nice ranch in there. So he went to grandma and granddad, and he says, I'm selling out, how much can you afford to give me for my place? And uh, they said, well, we can't afford to pay what it's worth. You're going to have to sell one of those big outfits like the kitchen. And he says, I didn't ask you who I should sell to. I asked, how much can you afford to pay? So they reached an understanding on it. They bought his place, which greatly expanded their holdings. Well, then the Depression hit. They couldn't make payments. And he says, pay what you can. When the depression's over, then you can catch up. It won't last forever. So that's, a lot of people were foreclosed on then. That's how they were not foreclosed on and they kept that ranch and, and, uh, and they, his nieces and stuff inherited his half, we got half the mineral rights, his nieces got half and, and they moved to California. Dad always told me, he says, when it comes to leasing mineral rights, you take care of them because Charlie Wright took care of us. And so when they want to lease minerals, uh, we represent them on the minerals. And we've since thrown in with the Kitchen Mineral Trust, which is over 6,000 net acres. So we have about 10,000 net acres to, to deal with the oil companies. And so we have a large block of minerals that, that we have a lot of clout with. And, and the uh, trustee of the Kitchen Minerals, he's from Lance Creek. He married Sherry Crowfoot. Uh, he was a petroleum engineer. And when the oil business crashed, he went to law school and moved to Bakersfield, California. So there you have a petroleum engineer with a law degree and, and he knows the ins and outs. We just let him take care of it, do the negotiate. So uh, that's why we're here and that's why we own a lot of the kitchen land now and like I say it's gone full circle back to Katie. <laughs> Katie Clay became Katie Cruzy and <laughs> so it's a pretty interesting story. It's probably the story of the West, you know how 
places got big and then they cranked and, and man changed hands and everything. Uh, any hand, any questions? There's so many things I've learned that, <laughs> that I can bore you to tears. <coughs> what years were the first homesteads? Uh, you know, uh, I've got the plats here. This is when they, this is when they were uh, uh, patented, which was five years after they were deeded. But they were the end of the 1990s. I mean, 1890s, yeah, uh, when they actually uh, filed on them. And then, if you look at this, a lot of them, here's one, uh, Marcy Russell, I don't know if somebody might remember Jimmy Russell. Anyway, the patent date is 26, 1926. These are the places that are off the creek, up on the hills, and, and none of those people stuck around. Here's 1922. And then you go back, like I say, uh, I don't have the page with Mary Taylor's on there, but that was in later 90s. When did J.P. Mill homestead uh, out there? His wife's patent date was 05, 1905, and his patent date was 1906. So that had been right in front of the century. That they and like uh, you know like uh, here's one that's 31 30, 24 uh, granddad patent date was 24 on his additional and uh, 17 on his original so he filed on that in 1912 did, Jim, did some of those the people come there and didn't file for a homestead right away? So consequently, you know, they've been there a lot longer than what their patent date was or anything like that. It's sure possible. I know that all those big ranches, they really didn't have much land. They, they might have actually had a little chunk, you know, for around their headquarters and stuff, but I did deal for the last Creek School. I looked all over for it. I got reams of historical data and I can't find it, but uh, like the URL on Last Creek, they didn't really own anything. They were just squatting. Most of all those big, like 77 Ranch and all those places like that, Key Lines and, and all those, this whole country. I, I mapped all that out for the kids at Last Creek and their range and the, you just can't imagine the number of cows they had They've got, uh, uh, Abspal was the uh, foreman for the, was it the 1889 Roundup? The huge Roundup. And they had like 2,000 head of horses and, on this Roundup and they run, and they had the number of cattle in their ranges and you just can't imagine all those cattle and it's a, no wonder they all died. <laughs> just thousands of cattle all this country out here. Well, I know when my grandfather, he came to where we're at there now in 1980. But I think the patent date is 16. Now, you so, know, it's five, the patent date would be five years yeah, after they filed. You know, but so... Maybe so he didn't there. file right away. What well, must have, you know. Yeah. So I, I wondered if I've never had any, you know, we've got that thing in the basement here at the museum that shows all that, you know, when the patent dates and all that. and. Uh, I never uh, researched anything to see if you know people were there that you know were there earlier, but their patent date is quite a bit later, more than five years later. You know, a lot of these places were well, not a lot. They were, if they're the biggest outfit, there was probably some illegal stuff going on. For example, Fisters, all that country out there, there's not a drop of water, and they hired these cowboys and have them homestead, right? And when it came time to prove up, they'd have to have an inspector go out there. Well, they had a cabin on skids. They skid it out there. They'd have a couple of gunny sacks full of tin cans, a couple of buckets full of, of uh, ash, 
they dump it out there. Yep, he's been living here. Well, they didn't live out there. That's why you see all that country out there. It is deeded where Fisters were, but there wasn't anybody ever lived out there. It was all phony. And, and I'm told there was some money changed hands with the inspector. Uh, but that's what they did. They dragged a, a cat out there. A lot there. of those were railroaders. Were they? Yeah. And then they just get somebody else that hadn't homesteaded yet. That was, I guess, the first question to ask if you homesteaded. <laughs> okay, stipulation is you got a homestead. My, yeah, grand that water out there. <laughs> My grandfather came to the territory in 1870 and worked for a surveyor general of the territory. And of course, he said he surveyed a lot of areas, including Old Fort Laramie, and he found that wonderful spring-fed head of the Niagara River and acquired a squatter's claim on that before it was homesteaded. And I don't know how he acquired the rest of it. He probably bought out some other homesteaders that had given up. But that's where the Nelson Ranges are. And did he eventually home, I mean, did he file for a patent on it then? I have no idea, but it, my cousin probably knows. <laughs> well, it'd be in the book with... Uh, I, I don't know that. I just was told that he didn't homestead to begin with. But well, he started his uh, Herford Ranch in 1880. Yeah, they didn't really feel a need to, you mm -hmm. know. No. Through all this country, what the heck. Well, I don't think the Homestead Act even was enacted yet. Hey, I, you could be right. I've got... Well, that's before the turn There of the was century. multiple Homestead Acts and... Uh, I don't know if I threw that. I don't. I didn't throw those. I've got both the book books, uh, Wyoming by T. A. Larson. That might tell. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I remember. I don't remember reading it in that book. But anyway, there's multiple homestead acts as they moved west because they had to have more and more land. And the last one was the stock grazing act, where they could get an additional grazing allotment of 320 acres, or they could take their 640 acres as one allotment. If they took the 640 acres, they didn't get any mineral rights. If they took the 320, they got the mineral rights on that. And then their additional grazing 320, they didn't get them on that. That's why you see so many federal minerals uh, when you get out north there. The majority of that country is federal minerals. What was it about 1918 or somewhere around there that they you quit getting the minerals? I mean, unless you bought them from somebody else. I mean, get the minerals from the federal government. I couldn't tell you. I think it was. You know, if you did anything after that, that you got no I, minerals. I don't think that's correct because we've got minerals on these places that that uh, homestead in the 20s. Uh, and maybe because they were uh, applied for before that. that might be. I just thought I'd heard that somewhere. It was somewhere around there.